the excitement of TIFFs, PIFs, and cross-compliance um, by mapping out on your payment. This is very boring for everyone, I imagine. You, you, you draw a polygon uh, around areas that sh which you consider to be impenetrable scrub, and you remove them from your application. You're not being paid for that. OK. PIFs, TIFs, and crossing the plants. No. Any more from the floor? I've got one for Mengi. How do the costs compare for building the floating units to a land-based system? I don't got you. Yeah. How much does it cost oh, in comparison? Cost, yeah, cost. yeah. Oh, this one is about 2.6 million euros. Right. So, but we like to talk about business case <laughs> Mother Earth and not about business case money. And I think that's not uh, the way we used to think now, but it's the way we used to, should think in the future. Okay. Thank you. Any more? Uh, Matt, one for Matt. How many, uh, how large do you intend going with the deer unit on your place? Uh, we'll see when we get there, really. Yeah. Um, sky's the limit, times are changing. And I think opportunity to expand is probably around the corner, which we would like to do, but at to what level it needs to be manageable and it needs to maintain a, at, a, at a high welfare status, so we need to keep everything in check. But I mean, my goal would be you know, getting up to at least 1,000 hinds in the future. OK. Yeah, which is a big unit in the UK. Can you, yeah, we've got one down here. Oh, Anna. Uh, just a question for, for Charles. Um, how big a scale do you need to make rewilding work? Can it, does it have to be a large area so that everything interacts? Or can you do it a little bit more piecemeal? Nature needs space. Um, so the answer is you do need a lot of space. You need to have proper scale. And the more scale you have, as you can probably guess, the less management you need per hectare. So you're on that graph I showed at the beginning, the idea is that um, I know a lot of us have all talked about and probably are members of cluster farms, for instance. So one of the ideas is that you would, uh, as a cluster farm group, come together saying, well, this bit of the landscape, we could do something with for nature. And so scale does matter. You know, the smaller you get, the more, I suppose the easiest way to explain it, one Tamworth sow weighing 230 kilos will plough up 60 acres in a winter. If you consider a Tamworth sow or a pig to be a keystone species, how many days are you going to have on your four acres of a Tamworth sow? Or on your 1,200 acres, you can then have five breeding sows. See what I mean? So that, that, that's the art. So the, the bigger you become, the less management, uh, the more you can allow systems to run. The smaller you are, the more controlled and back into conventional conservation management. Okay, there's a question at the back there. A question for Charlie. Um, has there been a financial value placed on the carbon that's been locked up at NEP? Um, if not, have you got any suggestions about how this may be valued? I can't see where the speaker is. Um, a, a, paper, a paper study was done by DEFRA five years ago um, and looking at uh, business as usual in our old farming system to what we have done now, uh, it locked up um, uh, 50, well, let's, let's, let's get this right, um, it was 50 million cubic tons of carbon. It was worth about at five pounds a ton in the then market, it was worth um, about 14 million over a 50 year period in pounds, pounds sterling. So yes, uh, uh, but you know, uh, the, the, problem, the problem with locking up carbon sequestration, all, uh, as we all know, is so much more complex than we think. Uh, we're now getting uh, results through from uh, the Peruvian Amazon jungle saying that, uh, that actually it's a, it's, a, it's a greenhouse admitter. So, you know, the science is, 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 is still not settled on what's actually, what's actually being stored 
and what's not. So we're still in flux, I guess. I don't know where that... There's one down here. Yeah. Oh, this is a uh, question for Charlie. Um, Could you say who you are first? Oh, yes, my name's, sorry, Rupert Turnbull uh, from the Royal Agriculture University. Um, my question is, are you not worried that net, well, of net becoming a triple SI and therefore not being able to uh, do as, as well, change the landscape as much as you'd like to? I mean, it's, a, it's a very good question. And uh, I, su I suspect if we tried to um, <coughs> rip out all the scrubland now and go back into farming, which you could do, um, we would have a SSSI sl slapped on us to stop us doing that because we have become so important for nightingales and turtle doves and purple and butterfly. So the, so the answer is it is a risk. Uh, it's a risk that uh, we were open about with Natural England and the government at the time. We said we didn't want to become an SSSI. However successful it became, um, we didn't want to end up having that restriction slapped on us. But I guess if it, you know, a lot of public money has gone into the project, so I guess that um, if you try to change it, there would be problems. So it's a real risk. Okay. There's one over here underneath the camera. Is that Caroline there? Yeah. I, can you get Mike down there? And then we've got one off the app. Hi, Caroline Miller. Really enjoyed those presentations. Um, I've got a question for Sten. Hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Yeah, perfect. Um, so in the UK, we've had a campaign over a number of decades um, to encourage people to eat five fruit and vegetables a day, which has been proven is not working. People are not taking up that. Um, and you talked about not being able to actively say that, for example, eating broccoli prevents cancer. So how do we, how do we bridge the gap? I mean, we've, got, we've had um, cigarette packets with p um, terrible images on which have stopped people smoking as much, um, but how do we actually actively make people um, or encourage people to, to eat more fruit and veg to, to save their lives, basically? Well, in, in Holland, it's, it's, it's quite similar. We actually need to eat 350 grams of vegetables, but we only communicate 250, because if we say 350, it's becoming a, a stretch and people just say, well, forget about it. Um, and actually, the vegetable consumption in Holland last year decreased as well. So that made me tremendously sad, but uh, in um, the high-end cuisine, the top restaurants, they're using more and more vegetables every day because vegetables are exciting products. They're more diverse. There's a whole new world of vegetables. Um, and you see now that, that gastronomy is picking up more vegetables. And we see a lot of trends coming from gastronomy. So I'm very optimistic and I hope that, that a lot of farmers in here will see chefs as their um, spokesperson for their products because every good dish comes with a good story and it comes from oh this this is dear meat it comes from this this great guy was passionate about it uh, more storytelling for sure more and more storytelling and real stories transparent stories I think okay there's one from the East School can you put that through hi uh, it's a question for Charlie I'm Tom Clark I'm a OFC emerging leader apparently <laughs> and uh, I'm also a nature-friendly farmer, and food is my business, but I'm a nature-friendly farmer. What you've done at NEP is beautiful, and it's romantic, and I can see why people pay to come and see for themselves. But not every farm can be a theme park with safaris, and rewilding won't feed the world. It can't. It, does it have to be all or nothing? It's such a difficult one, this one. I mean, the answer is... I am not advocating, none of us are advocating that this is the solution, we've got to go rewilding. We're talking about how much more space we have to give nature. How much more space is, are we all willing to give up to nature? And that's the big question. And how much do we need to give up to nature to allow it to function? So I'm guessing we're all going to have to think about, you know, and Michael Gove, is helping us think about this quite seriously. How much more space are we going to give to nature and how is that space going to be given to nature? Rewilding is just an, a, a, one of the tools in the box. It's not the, it's not the panacea, it's not the solution, it's just one of the tools that could be used when you get to scale. 
the scale drifts down and you start to have to manage. The whole idea about this is allowing the animals to do the managing of your, your environment, which means you have to have space. So I think, we, I think we all must agree that we need to have a stable ecology to live going forward on this planet. So we have to work out how to give that space to nature and that food production, that space. I think we can work together. And we, it's very exciting when you, when, you, when you actually think about giving a bit of space to nature. It becomes a part of what you're doing, a part of your gut and your feeling and, and that whole thing of life pouring back into your landscape. I promise you, it is so exciting. So I think that we will be able to work to, we will not work together, but we will be able to do something extraordinary together. Okay, there's one down here. Can you just hand the mic? Oh, you can't quite. <laughs> I'll do one off the app just while you get lined up, actually. Um, Charlie, there's a question here which says, uh, do you think it's morally right to take good fertile soil out of food production? when other speakers talk of hunger? I think I've sort of answered that question just by what I've just said. I mean, I, OK, what have, we, what have we got? We've got 40% waste. We've got you know, the, the, this, all this, uh, you know, the, the, the transference of nutrients from, from third world countries to the, to the, to the West. The, all these questions become incredibly complex. Yeah. I think what we need to concentrate on, though, is we've got to have this space for nature within our own environment. I mean, wh why shouldn't we? Why wouldn't we want to have something that is, uh, that, is, that is working and functioning on a landscape scale? I, I, can't understand, I can't understand any way other than that going forward. I can't understand how it could function, how we want to move forward. Okay. Maybe I can add something to that, because I think most of the time when I do a speech, people ask me, do we need to give up uh, the farms like we have today? But I think we have to look at a new system, a combination, a hybrid system, because the thing you are doing now is so interesting and good for the environment, but to produce enough food, our system is also one. So I think we have to look in the opportunity to opportunities, the different opportunities, and to make a combination and make a hybrid system. It's not this or that, but okay. one and one. This gentleman down here. Yeah. Garank uh, Davis, uh, Farmers Union of Wales. Uh, sorry, Charles, this is for you as well. Um, how far down the line your plans would have been without the public money that's been ploughed into your um, Nepa State dream? And how do you see tenant farms fitting into this format going into the future? I don't think we would have got off the starting block because I don't think I was willing to risk the sort of capital money that needed to be put in to build fences, you know, whatever it is, 40 miles of fences, removing 114 miles of fences. There's a lot of capital that needs to be spent to do this. So for me, it wasn't an option. I didn't, you know, I wouldn't go, well, I know, know that it's going to work. It's going to be fine. I'm going to go ahead and do it. I needed to have that relationship with Natural England and the government to then go forward. Your second part of your question, sorry? Where do you see tenant farms? I think, again, you know, so, you know, this idea of cluster farms, that, you know, you, you want to talk to your neighbours, you want to have part of them in, in the whole story. So I can't see any, I mean, I can see, you, I mean, our, for instance, our tenant farmer, he has been able to get HLS because he's next door to us and it wasn't a target area, and so he's been able to do that. So... No, I feel it could be I, you know, but you're talking about hypothetical things that I'm, you know, I mean, I, w I wouldn't force my tenant farmers to do anything that they're, they're not wanting, you know, there's a tenancy and there's a, you know, I don't, don't quite understand where you're going with that. I mean, I can see that there's real problems in the other way around. I know, know states where you've got tenant farmers that are, you know, growing huge quantities of maize for biomass boilers that are ripping the soil out of the, the estate, heart of the estate and disappearing down, down the river. 
we can't, you know, the, the landlord can't even do anything about that. So, you know, I, I, I don't know quite where you're going with that. I mean, I don't know if it's not a... Okay, can I suggest you have a chat yeah. afterwards? Just <laughs> have a, yeah. um, Nigel, you've got one for Matt, I believe. Yeah, yeah Nigel Scollin, Queen's University in Belfast. Matt, I really would like to congratulate you on your investment vision. Your wife and yourself, family, have, have put into your, your, uh, your uh, big story in, in Cornwall. The red meat sector comes under a lot of criticism. Uh, it's, we read a lot about negative <coughs> aspects of meat production today and meat consumption, health aspects. Can you give us some further insights into how the industry should tackle that to, to really push a more positive environment for the industry? Again, we're very, very lax as an industry in terms of working together and putting good, solid information out there. And again, everybody's got a, you know, something's right in what they say. So for us as an industry, I mean, I was reading an article back from New Zealand how the equivalent of the NHS is struggling with iron and mineral deficiencies in people because of this vegan push through lack of education and it's having a huge backlash on the, the NHS sector, the equivalent in New Zealand. So it's, but we don't see that information. And as us as farmers, like every aspect, we all have 10% that we don't really want the public getting out there to see, but they seem to find them and that drags the rest of us back with it. But I think, again, it's poor form to run another business down and try and grow yourself, but we do need to be a little bit more proactive in putting out that information that we're not trying to feed everybody only red meat. We're just trying to put the information out there that it is healthy to eat red meat at a, you know, at a level that's sustainable. And I think we really, really need to start pouring some money as a farming sector and towards education, in, not in retaliation, but in terms of education from the, uh, from the flip side of the coin. Okay, we've got time for one more, just over here. Is there a microphone? Yeah. William Hare from the East of England Agricultural Society. This is probably an unfair question to ask this panel, but I'd like to ask it this morning. You've all done some, made some fundamental changes to your businesses and how you work. Um, we've heard a lot this morning about innovation, about change, how we have to change, we have to adapt. We've got a workforce at the minute, and even got a management level that are working with traditional skills, and we're gonna to have to learn how to farm all over again with what the future holds. How can we actually prepare the people that are doing it at the minute, but how can we make sure we get the people coming along in the future prepared as well? Because universities were mentioned a lot. Universities are great, they're important, but actually agricultural colleges get very, very, very short changed and are starved of funding and they're starved of the right people to actually impart that knowledge and motivate those people. So how can we make sure that we've got the best young people coming forward with the best skills to actually adopt to this innovation? Who'd like to answer that one? Well, one thing I can say, if, if you want to have young people to come and work for you, you have to give them a, a sense of purpose. I think purpose-driven companies are very attractive to, to youngsters. Um, people link their, their persona to the companies that they work with. I'm very proud to be working for the company that I work for. And I think that's very crucial for youngsters. Uh, pay is a very important, but second and third, <coughs> it's, it's be part of a change, be part of something good. Absolutely. And that, I know that you attract a lot of young people yes. because it's innovating, it's cutting edge, and it's, yeah, it's like a magnet for young people. So you have to give youngsters the opportunity to make change and to be part of uh, a better future. Yes, and the other thing for us is also, for example, we work together with Microsoft. So we collect a lot of data and we cross the data and we see that's the future for youngsters. And I already mentioned that it's not only in the sector, but it's also across the sectors. So when you're looking across the sectors and combining that different kind of fields of knowledge, then you come new, into new innovations and you attract youngsters. So I think uh, also the uh, universities should look in that opportunities. Okay. 
Well, I think we'll, if there are no more, we'll bring this session to a close. Um, thank you, everybody. Cool. I think they all deserve a round of applause again for their efforts.